Hi, and welcome back to the NCS podcast current series. This is Lauren Kaufman. I'm a neurointensivist at Temple University in Philadelphia. And today I'd like to welcome onto the podcast authors of the recent Currents article, Point of Care Ultrasound Education and Neurocritical Care, A Call to Action. So today I'd like to welcome Dr. Judy Chang. She's a neurointensivist at Weill Cornell, New York Presbyterian, and Dr. Tanuja Subramaniam, who is a neurointensivist at Brown University. Welcome, both of you. Thank you so much. So we'll make sure we include the article in the show notes, but um, for people that may not have seen that article in Currents, before we get into, you know, why it's important that we're discussing this within the realm of neurocritical care, can you guys just tell me a little bit about the evidence for just POCUS and critical care in general? Um, sure, I, you know, I can go first. Um, so in the past decade or so, there has been some real changes um, in the utilization of focus in terms of its prevalence, uh, medical provider attitudes, um, especially in critical care and acute medicine fields. Um, for instance, you know, in emergency medicine, um, focus focus is definitely uh, considered a foundational skill. Um, and in conjunction with this, you know, there's been a growing body of literature supporting its use. Uh, with guidelines coming out, um, expert consensus statements um, on um, the use of focus. Um, and also, in addition to that, um, the ACGME, ACGME has uh, requirements for focus education in some residencies and fellowships, such as emergency medicine and pulmonary critical care medicine. Um, in terms of what the literature is actually showing with regards to focus use, um, across disciplines, um, focus is has been shown to be a good diagnostic tool. For instance, there has been um, several studies showing high accuracy for the diagnosis of um, something like pneumonia or uh, de detecting acute decompensated heart failure. Um, in fact, you know, there's one to two studies showing that um, it's better than chest x-ray um, for detection of uh, decompensated heart failure. And because of its portability and ease of use, um, it allows for introduction of new clinical data quickly, which expedites and um, changes management. Um, while there are less studies looking um, directly at outcomes, there has been um, you know, a fairly consistent demonstration of uh, endpoints such as improved diagnostic ac accuracy and faster time to treatment. Um, and I would also add, you know, from a procedural standpoint, um, ultrasound guidance for procedures such as central line and chest tube insertion, insertion has been shown um, to decrease complication rates. Great. I mean, I think a lot of us are kind of familiar with um, applications for its use in general critical care, and you touched upon it. But why don't we talk about some more like neurospecific examples of um, different ways we can incorporate it into our practice? Yeah, absolutely. So neuroultrasonography. Uh, is very exciting. Um, just, you know, we all know optic nerve sheath diameters, which are fantastic. And just to talk about ocular ultrasound, shout out to Dr. Schultz. She just gave a fantastic webinar um, this past week on ocular ultrasound. And it goes beyond optic nerve sheath diameters, which we know, um, you know, we measure to monitor ICP, but you can diagnose retinal detachments, posterior vitreous attachments, um, detachments, sorry. And you can also use colored Dopplers to really look for flow to diagnose CRAOs. Um, and all of this is actually discussed in our webinar, but more excitingly, you know, using TCDs um, as a non-invasive marker of ICP, looking at the pulse utility index, and you can diagnose and monitor vasospasm as well. Um, and then we have our hemicranies um, in looking at hemorrhage sizes, midline shift, it's really amazing how um, neuroultrasonography is also growing. Yeah, you know, I think in the article you mentioned using it for um, diagnosis of mass lesions and midline shift. I'm just curious, uh, do you do that in your practice for these patients that are hemicranial patients? Because I personally have never seen that done. I still rely on head CT imaging because I think, you know, we do it inconsistently so. And I think that actually talks to a, a wider cult of our paper of training and having POCUS consensus guidelines. But absolutely, I think it's interesting to take a look. Um, but in our IC, we still rely on the traditional ways of head CT. Cool, thanks. Um, now, you just kind of alluded to this kind of call to neurocritical care. So I guess, how would you describe the current state of ultrasound use in neurocritical care practice? So within neurocritical care currently, 
Um, we lack concrete data on focus use um, and competency um, across new career programs um, in the country. Um, however, um, it is believed it's thought that focus adopt uh, adoption is um, highly variable. Um, there is one recently concluded nationwide survey of focal skills and utilization by neurocritical care practitioners. Um, once it's published, we hope it'll provide some valuable insights um, on this. Um, otherwise, uh, the neurocritical care literature on focus is pretty sparse. Most publications are primarily focused on narrative reviews of neural ultrasound specific applications. Um, there is uh, less on body ultrasound applications in the neurocritically ill population, and in general, just fewer trials um, and original research being done in our patient population. Um, there is also an absence of professional society um, issued guidelines um, or position statement on bedside ultrasonography for our uh, neurocritical care practitioners. For instance, if you contrast that with, um, you know, Society of Critical Care Medicine, uh, American College of Emergency Physicians, uh, American College of Test Physicians, they have pretty detailed guidelines with guidance regarding scope of practice and recommendations regarding training and defining com uh, competency. Okay, so it sounds like there might be some new um statement coming out in the near future regarding the current state of ultrasound use in neurocritical care. But you mentioned that there's a lot of um, variability in terms of like training. Uh, I don't know if there's any, you know, very limited data on that, or could you just maybe even speak to your own experiences as to like, did you learn this in fellowship or did you have to seek out the training um, on your own once you're in practice? Uh, for sure. So um, the neurocritical care ACGME common program requirements um, does not um, have focus in it, um, which is, you know, dif it differs from other um, critical care um, ACGME program requirements. Um, for me, during training, um, I suppose I was pretty lucky um, in my fellowship. Um, we had, um, so in my fellowship, um, we had different types of training we could undergo. Um, our program um, had us train under emergency physicians um, to do like a dedicated couple of weeks training under them to learn general um, critical care point of point of care ultrasound. Um, and we uh, also had uh, one to two attendings that um, had incorporated um, ultrasound to their practice. And so we were also able to practice uh, in, within our unit uh, with these specific attendings. Um, and in addition to that, we were given, um, you know, time to do um, structured courses. Um, I did one that was run by emergency medicine. Um, um, and um, I had colleagues who did uh, courses that were uh, run by hospitalists. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I'm very lucky, just like Anuja, you know, my fellowship was very heavy on point of care ultrasound, but I believe it was really due to the collaborative and really interdepartmental nature of critical care at that institution. Um, my point of care ultrasound teachers were ICU trained anesthesiologists, you know, uh, medical intensivists, cardiac intensivists. It, but it wasn't really through my um, my own neurointensive care attendings that taught me POCUS, but it was through other departments. And I really think that that is probably something that, um, you know, we're going to have to rely on as we work with ACGME to kind of add in POCUS milestones is that because there is this lag of POCUS competent attendings that can teach, right, we're going to have to rely on our, our colleagues. And I think it's actually honestly a win-win because you get to forge these, um, you know, these POCUS conferences and, uh, you know, other things to with these different apartments and, and learn from them. So I think it's great. Awesome. Um, so, you know, you guys kind of chatted about your experiences and training, but what about now? Like, do you still do it in your daily practice? I definitely still use it in my daily practice. Um, we, I, I use it um, and I've, you know, I've trained a bunch of our um, APPs um, to learn um, point of care ultrasound, um, cardiac and lung 
uh, is what we predominantly use. And some bedside TCDs too, for our subarach patients, um, even now patients, TBI patients. Um, so yeah, definitely part of my practice. Yeah, I love using it in practice. And I'm actually going to be um, taking a new course to expand my knowledge of POCUS and because I, I would love to do bedside TCDs. Um, so Awesome. Uh, now, how do you think people can get more consistent training? You mentioned, you know, it's a collaborative effort, you know, build those multidisciplinary um, contacts and work with people in maybe the emergency room or general critical care. Um, but what else can we do? Um, yeah. Oh, Judy, you want to go ahead first? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, first an exposure and an access issue for our trainees and um, fellows. But I, I do think that with the ultrasound section, we've tried offering, you know, <clears throat> a webinar series. We are offering monthly meetings. Um, there's an ongoing POCUS case series on currents. We're now on TikTok. So other things, you know, this, that's kind of how we're trying to expand the exposure to um, neurocritical care trainees and fellows. But I think ultimately it's going to have to be through residency and fellowship training to produce like point of care milestones and then in turn putting pressure on in, you know, in individual institutions um, for finding ways for their fellows and residents to train. Um, yeah, to, to follow up with what, you know, Judy had said, I think a, a good guide on how to improve you know, ultrasound adoption in neurocritical care is to look at how other societies' specialities have adopted and disseminated the practice of ultrasound within their fields. Um, and one important step I think that has really helped propagate focus in other fields is having professional bodies affirm the practice of ultrasound within their respective fields, defining the scope of practice, core competencies, and make recommendations for training um, that's required to achieve competence. Um, and then next, from like an institutional perspective, when you look at the medical education literature, um, the consistent team that you see is having having ultrasound competent faculty um, and providing with time and providing them with time and funding to successfully develop and implement an ultrasound education um, or training curriculum. Um, in addition to you know. Um, being able to develop assessment programs and competency um, programs. Um, beyond that, um, you know, making efforts to providing frameworks on how to develop, um, how to use ultrasound in their daily practice, and perhaps even going further with things like credentialing and billing. Um, System-wide implementation aside, if you're looking to develop learn skills on your own, there are many excellent nationwide courses. Um, the American College of Medical Physicians run some. Um, the Society of Critical Care Medicine runs a pretty famous um, focus course. Um, and, you know, many other societies run these focus course too um, that you can take. And, you know, um, in keeping up with your skills, there are just so many resources now you can find online. Um, really, really great websites, really great um, YouTube videos um, to continue your education on ultrasound. Cool. So I've, I mean, I've personally seen some of these um, things on social media where you're promoting cases or um, uh, advertising for some of the webinars, but as people that are uh, involved with the ultrasound section within neurocritical care at the society, uh, can you just tell us about, I guess, what your section does if people want to get involved, how, how do they do that? Yeah, so if people are interested in getting more involved with POCUS in neurocritical care, we have monthly meetings to start every month at the end of the month on Wednesday. Um, we have a WhatsApp group, um, but we use these meetings to discuss the agenda, things we want to see out of the ultrasound committee, things we want to do with the ultrasound committee. And that's actually how uh, Tanuja mentioned um, a, a publication about a, a POCUS survey, and that came out of this meeting. Um, on top of that, this is used for ideas such as, you know, getting on TikTok. This all came about from these monthly meetings with collaborate, international um, collaboration, which is really fantastic and all over the U.S. as well. Um, but 
you know, other ways to get involved in uh, at the annual Neurocritical Society meeting, we have our workshop and we're always looking for people to volunteer for talks or volunteer to kind of help teach. Um, but last year, we also had an ultrasound booth where we kind of taught, you know, tips and tricks on some POCUS just, you know, in the actual meeting booth. And so that was really great. And, you know, shout out to Erica and Kelly Rath, um, Erica Sigmund and Kelly Rath, who um, have just been tremendous as the current POCUS chairs. Um, and then we, you know, have the involvement of the POCUS case series on currents. Uh, so many ways of getting involved. So you mentioned the WhatsApp group and the monthly meeting. So if people want to join that, how do they make that happen? You can email me, contact me, RT Sarwal, Eric. I mean, anybody. Um, there's there's a wide network, but you can also message us on the through the Neurocritical Care Society. Um, we do have a uh, a section, um, and so you can message out, and we will be able to add you immediately. Awesome. Any other uh, final words you want to share with the listeners? I think this is a really exciting time for POCUS in neurocritical care with, you know, the increase in use of neuro ultrasonography. Um, it's just, you know, really turning the tides and hoping that um, we can work with ACGME and UCNS to develop milestones, but also having the society create consensus guidelines is really going to be important for our um, uh, you know, for us to move forward um, along with the other um, intensive care specialties. Yeah, I would like to just echo what Judy was saying. It is, uh, this is an exciting time. Um, and ultimately, you know, I, uh, we believe that achieving widespread um, focus adoption and use in neurocritical care um, requires an active acknowledgement within, within the field of the changing landscape um, on incorporation of this wonderful technology into um, the practice of critical care medicine. Well, thank you both so much for joining. We'll make sure we include the link to that article in the show notes. To check out this or other Currents content, please head to currents.neurocriticalcare.org. As a reminder, NCS offers free CME for select podcasts. Listen via the NCS Learning Center and complete a short survey to receive your credits. Otherwise, you can access the NCS podcast, review, get your pods, and don't forget to add us your favorites. Make sure you'll never miss an episode. <laughs>